Hello dear brothers and sisters and welcome to this meeting. The lecture is on suffering in the flesh and the corresponding text is in 1 Peter chapter 4 and I would like to read the two first verses. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1. Christ then having suffered for us in the flesh do ye also arm yourselves with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has done with sin, no longer to live the rest of his life in the flesh to man's lusts, but to God's will. We would like to put this message under three headlines. First of all, we are going to consider a little bit the context in which Peter puts these verses. Secondly, we would like to focus, focus on the statement here, Christ has suffered for us. And thirdly, the practical implication, what does it mean for us? How can we suffer for him, how can we learn from him? Now, first of all, Peter, the Apostle Peter and his letter. Peter had a special ministry relative to the earthly people of Israel, to the believers who came out of the Jews. And Peter writes his letter to Christians who formerly were Jews, but who accepted the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. These believers were living as strangers in this world and they were suffering. They were suffering in a twofold way. First of all, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, they were sojourners of the dispersion. As Jews, they were living in a strange land, in a foreign land, and there they had to suffer. But secondly, they were believers, they believed in the Lord Jesus, they had become Christians, and also, as Christians, they suffered in an unbelieving world around them. These Jews had expected the kingdom of God to come. They had been waiting for the Messiah to establish that kingdom, that kingdom of glory here on earth. But when Christ came, he was rejected and the kingdom was not established in power and might and glory. But this kingdom is now on earth, but the king is rejected and he has gone back to glory. Of course, these believers as Jews were a little bit disappointed that the kingdom had not been established in might and power and glory. Now Peter writes to these believers who on the one hand were suffering, who on the other hand had a certain disappointment and he wrote to these believers in order to encourage them, in order to establish them in their Christian faith. And Peter does two things. First of all, he tells them that suffering is not a strange thing for believers. It is, so to say, normal that we as Christians suffer on earth, suffer in this world. We are not from this world, yet we are in the world, and as Christ has suffered here on earth, we have to suffer. That is a characteristic of the kingdom of God in the present time. We suffer. That is one thing. 
But on the other hand, Peter points out to the wonderful glory to come. Peter speaks of the glory of that kingdom, which will be a future glory. Hence, Christians live in a world, they go now through sufferings, but at the end the glory of that wonderful kingdom is waiting for us. There are two key words in this first letter. The one is <clears throat> suffering and the other is glory. You get these two key words, sufferings and glory, more than 15 times or around 15 times each. The pathway of the Christian is a pathway through sufferings to glory. Let us just read two examples. One is in chapter 4 and I would like to read verse 13. But as ye have share in the sufferings of Christ, rejoice that in the revelation of his glory also ye may rejoice with exaltation. And chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, when ye have suffered for a little while, himself shall make perfect, establish, strengthen, ground. To him be the glory and the might for the ages of the ages. Amen. So here you have two examples where sufferings and glory are directly connected together. So Peter is encouraging these believers who now were passing through sufferings by the moment when that wonderful glory will come. And glory in the first letter to Peter in most places is not directly the heavenly glory, the glory of the house of uh, our Father, but glory has to do with the glory of that kingdom to come. But Peter does a second thing. He puts the Lord Jesus as the perfect example before the eyes of those who received his letter. And he tells them, have a look, the pathway of Christ is exactly your pathway. When Christ came down on earth, he was rejected. The kingdom was not established in power and glory. Christ was rejected and instead of reigning, he had to suffer. The pathway of Christ was a pathway through suffering to glory. That was already established in the Old Testament. Chapter 1 verse 11 says that the prophets pointed out testifying before of the sufferings which belonged to Christ and the glories after these. So you see, the Lord Jesus, when he came as the Messiah, as the promised Messiah on earth, in order to start that wonderful kingdom, he was rejected. He went through deep sufferings. But then, after, the, after these sufferings, the Lord went to glory. And this is exactly what these believers, these Jewish believers were experiencing. They went through suffering, but Peter presented the glory as that wonderful target. Now, our situation, of course, today is different from the situation of these Jewish believers, but yet the principle, the principle is also valid for us. We also go through sufferings now. We have to suffer, but we go to glory, from suffering to glory. And in this, we follow the steps of 
of our Lord Jesus. Now, this leads me to the second part. Consider Christ who suffered. We have read in verse 1 of our chapter 4, Christ then having suffered for us in the flesh. Now we can ask some questions. The first question I would like to ask is who suffered? Well, the answer is obvious. It is Christ who suffered. And we are very much used to this expression, Christ suffered for us. It is not the only time here that Peter speaks about Christ who suffered. But imagine Christ, that is the Messiah, that is the anointed, that is the one who according to the purpose of God should establish the kingdom here on earth. Christ the King, Christ the priest, Christ the prophet, the anointed one. He came as Messiah, he came as Christ in order to establish that kingdom but as we have seen he has been rejected. He was expected as the king but there was no throne. There was a cross. He was rejected. Let us turn for a brief moment to the prophet of Daniel, chapter 9, where Daniel speaks about these 70 weeks. And in Daniel, chapter 9, we read that in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off and shall have nothing. He was rejected. He was the one who suffered. And for us, dear friends, it is so encouraging to see the Lord Jesus as the one who suffered, to focus on him, the man of sorrows, and the one who was acquainted with grief, or we could also translate, he was familiar to suffering. He was characterized by suffering. Let us turn for a brief moment to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, well-known verses, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking steadfastly, on Jesus, the leader and completer of faith, who in view of the joy lying before him, that is the glory, endured the cross, having despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider well him who endured so great contradiction from sinners against himself, that ye be not weary, fainting in your minds. Here again you have Christ as our wonderful example, the one who went through sufferings to glory. We have read about the cross, we have read about the shame, we have read about that great contradiction. That was what Christ endured here on earth instead of being received as a king. There was the cross, there was the shame, there was that contradiction and we are told to look steadfastly on him. There is a note looking steadfastly and the note says the word means looking away from other things and fixing the eye exclusively on him. And in verse 3 we are told, consider well him. Focus on Christ. Have a close look on how he, the King, the Messiah, suffered when he was here on earth. For us, that is a great encouragement. Now that is the first question, who suffered? Now the second question, what has Christ done? 
Of course, he has suffered. What does it mean to suffer? The word means to experience ill-treating, to be ill-treated. And how much our Lord Jesus was ill-treated? How much did he suffer? Nobody never ever suffered like he suffered. He suffered because it was God's will. He suffered from the side, from the hand of his enemies. But he also suffered from the side of his friends, his disciples, those who were so near to him. He suffered from our hand. But of course, at the cross in the three hours of darkness, he also suffered being forsaken from his God. And when we ask the question, when did Christ suffer? We know he suffered not only on the cross, not only in the three hours of darkness. There he suffered for our sins, but he suffered during the whole uh, life. And his sufferings were physical sufferings and his sufferings were mental sufferings. Yes, he was really the man of sorrows and acquainted with sufferings. Now, for whom or when did Christ suffer? This is another important question. He did not suffer for his own sake, not because he had some, done something wrong. No, the Bible says he suffered for us. Christ then having suffered for us. The same you get in chapter 2 verse 21. For this have ye been called, for Christ also has suffered for us. The sufferings of Christ were for us. Of course, on the cross, during these three hours of darkness, he suffered for us, he suffered for our sins. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 tells us, For Christ indeed has once suffered for sins, for our sins, of course, it's again for us, but for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Christ died for us. His sufferings on the cross during the three hours of darkness, we call them the atoning sufferings. And only on the cross, only during the three hours of darkness, the Lord Jesus suffered for our sins. And in this, he is unique. Nobody never ever can follow him passing through this terrible judgment of God during the three hours of darkness. But Christ suffered for us also during his life. And when we have read here, Christ then having suffered for us in the flesh, this does not refer to the atoning sufferings. This does not refer to the suffering during the three hours of darkness. As well in chapter 2, the verse we have read in verse 22, for Christ has suffered for us. The apostle adds, leaving you a model, an example, a pattern. This is not the atoning suffering. That is the suffering of Christ during his life. In verse, chapter 3, verse 18, it is different. When Peter says, For Christ indeed has once suffered for sins, he speaks of the atoning sufferings of Christ on the cross. We could also ask the question, How has Christ suffered? And the answer is, Christ then having suffered for us, in the flesh. What does it mean in the flesh? We know that flesh has a different meaning in the New Testament. Sometimes flesh 
means the sin, the principle of sin in us. We call it the old nature. This expression does not, uh, is not found in the Bible, but it is true. The sin, the flesh, that is the old nature. That is what comes out of the old nature, sin. But flesh had all, has also another meaning. Flesh can also mean the mankind. The word became flesh. John 1 verse 14. That means the Lord Jesus, the eternal word, became man. That is his incarnation. And that is the same meaning here. Christ having suffered for us in the flesh or in flesh. That means as a perfect man here on earth. He was and he is the everlasting God, the eternal Son of God, but he became man. The word, I repeat, became flesh. And as man, as perfect man, Christ has suffered here on earth. And for us, this means that the Lord Jesus understands us perfectly in our circumstances through which we go as man. He knows our sorrows. He knows our griefs. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our concerns. He knows our pains. He knows everything. He passed through like we do. He was tempted in everything apart from sin. He suffered in the flesh as man. He suffered from the first moment of his life until the end. And we can ask another question, which is an important question. Why was it necessary that Christ had to suffer during his life of around 33 years? Was it not enough to come down on earth in order to die on that shameful cross, in order to fulfill atonement, in order to bear our sins? Was it not necessary? Why did Christ suffer during his life? Why did Christ suffer in the flesh? And I would like to give three answers to this question. There are more, but I would just like to give three answers to that question. Why was it necessary that Christ had to suffer during his life on earth? The first answer is in order to show his perfectness, in order to show that he really was the perfect man who was able to accomplish that great mission to die for us on Calvary's cross. He fulfilled all the requirements to be the lamb, the spotless, blameless lamb of God. That is the first answer. The second answer is, and that is what we have already touched on a little bit, to be a merciful and faithful high priest. This is what we get in Hebrews, of course. The Lord Jesus understands us in our circumstances because he passed through. We can never say, Lord Jesus, you cannot understand me. I am in so difficult circumstances. He will also tell you, well, my friend, my circumstances were much deeper than yours are. We have a merciful and faithful high priest. But the third answer, and that refers again to what Peter tells us in his first letter, the third reason is in Christ suffered in order to set us an example, that we can follow his steps. I would just like to turn very briefly to John chapter 15, that great chapter about fruit bearing. And here in verse 18 we read, John 15 verse 18, In the world, uh, if the world hate you, you know that it has hated me before you. You see, the Lord Jesus has been hated here on earth. 
he was rejected. And we will be hated. We will be rejected. He had to suffer and we will suffer in this sense as he has suffered. So he has set us an example. Brief summary and resume of that second part. Christ has suffered for us in the flesh in order to set us an example, in order to help us in our very circumstances here on earth. Now, the third part is the practical part. We read in verse 1, second part, arm yourself, uh, do ye also, arm yourself with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has done with sin no longer to relive the rest of his life in the flesh to man's lusts, but to God's will. Now here we are told to learn from Christ, to suffer with him, to suffer for him, and to do not the will of our own mind, but the will of God. Not to live the rest of our life in the flesh, to man's lusts, but to God's will. Now the approach is a very personal, isn't it? He says, do ye also arm yourselves? The approach, I repeat, is a very personal one. Peter means me and you, you and me. Arm, do ye also <coughs> arm yourself? This, of course, dear friends, has to do with our responsibility. We love to focus on Christ. We love to contemplate him as perfect man on earth, also in his suffering. We contemplate his death on the cross and we do this, of course, of course with greatest thankfulness. But let us not forget, there is also a responsibility that is connected to what Christ has done for us. And this is what we get here. Do ye also arm yourselves? We have to arm ourselves. That means we have to get ready for war. There is a spiritual warfare. We are living in a dangerous world. There are enemies around, so we have to put our arms on. We have to get our weapons, our spiritual weapons, of course, ready. We are at war. It's not a war against blood and flesh, of course not. And our arms are not normal arms like a sword, like a gun or some nuclear weapons or whatever. No, of course not. Our arms, they are spiritual arms and our warfare is a spiritual one. But we have enemies around and we know there are three great enemies of of the Christian, of the believer. The first enemy is always against us. That is the devil. He is always against. Against God, against Christ, against us. That is the first enemy. The second enemy we have is around us. That is the world with all its temptations. And the third enemy is within us. That is the sin, that is the flesh in the negative sense, that is the old nature. So we have these three enemies against us, around us and in us. So we live really in a dangerous place. We are constantly at warfare and therefore we are told, do ye also arm yourselves. We have to be ready for the warfare. We are continuously in that warfare and we continuously need our arms. Now there are other scriptures who tell us about our spiritual weapons that we have. For example, Ephesians 6. But here we have a very special arm and that arm is his mind. Do ye also arm yourself with the same mind? 
That means the mind of Christ. Go through the sufferings, go through your circumstances with the same mind as the Lord Jesus has revealed. Look at him, how he endured sufferings, how he acted, how he reacted when he was surrounded by his enemies. To put it this way, to consider Christ as the perfect example is the best weapon we have. Now his mind is a word that you get again in Hebrews chapter 4 in a different sense. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 we read about the word of God which is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword and penetrating to the division of soul and spirit both of joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now that is the word here, the intents of our heart. That means our thinking, our consideration, our purposes, the design of our hearts. But this mind has to do with our heart. What is the purpose? What is our consideration? What do we want in our heart? That is the mind. And the same mind means the mind of Christ. Again, I repeat, let us focus on him. Let us consider Christ, his mind. In Philippians 2 we read, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The word used there for mind is a different one, but yet the principle, the thought is the same. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Think as he thought. Have the purposes of heart that Christ had to do the will of God, to glorify God and to do nothing else. Ye also arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh. Here again, suffer in the flesh means suffering as man. Again, here flesh has nothing to do with the old nature. Christ suffered for us in the flesh and we suffer in the flesh. Now, if we suffer in the flesh, we suffer for righteousness' sake. We suffer as Christians. We don't suffer for different things, but we suffer for Christian. If, uh, we suffer as Christians here on earth. In verse 15 of the same chapter, 1 Peter 4, Peter says, let none of you suffer indeed as murderer or thief or evildoer or as overseer of other people's matter. But if as a Christian, if we suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in this man. By the way, this is the only time in the letters of the Apostles, in the epistles of the Apostles, that we get that name Christian. But Peter is using it here. If we suffer as Christians, let us not be ashamed. Now if we read here in verse 2, for he that has suffered in the flesh as man, as Christian here on earth, has done with sin. What does it mean? That is a principle that is established here by Peter. If we suffer with, for Christ, that will separate us practically from sinning. Suffering separates from sin. That is a very important uh, 
principle. If it says he has done with sins, what does it mean? That means he has stopped to sin. You get the same principle in chapter 2 in verse 24 we read Christ who himself bore our sins in his body on the cross in order that being dead to sins we may live to righteousness and in the Derby version that I prefer to use there is a note which says um, died dead to sins being dead to sins means having done with sin so I repeat the principle is that suffering for Christ's sake suffering as Christians down here on earth in our everyday life will separate us from sin but that is not all for he that has suffered in the flesh has done with sin what does it mean practically no longer to live the rest of his time in the flesh again in the flesh as man to man's lusts but to God's will here we have a choice or we live according to man's lusts or we live according to God's will that is the choice the very moment where we received Christ as our Savior makes a break in our life there is a time before our conversion when we did the will of Satan and we were his slaves and after our conversion we live to the glory of God in order to do God's will the conversion the moment when we accepted Christ in faith makes that break there is a time there was a time before and there is a time after the time before there was no choice we were Satan's slaves we were subject to bondage we had to sin there was no choice but after our conversion there is a choice we can continue to live according to the lust of flesh or we can live according to God's will and here Peter speaks of the rest of our life that is the life as believers and this should not be char characterized by the lust of man the lust of flesh by things by which this world is characterized but this Time, the present time in which we live the rest of our life should be characterized by God's will that is the choice we have here before us now you see in the instructions in the New Testament we very often get two things of admonishment of exhortation and encouragement there are verses that tell us what we should not do there are dangers and we should not do this and that don't do that don't touch that don't do that that is the one side but that's the negative side and this is what you get here uh, not to live to man's lusts and the other on the other hand we get that positive encouragement do this that is the positive way and you have these two sides of the coin also here what we should not do but on the contrary what we should do now I repeat natural man is characterized by the man's lusts desires or longings in the negative sense of course 
we should not and we should no longer be characterized by these things. You get some of these in verse 3, where Peter then speaks about the past time, the time before our conversion. For the past time is sufficient for us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. And then there are some of these nasty things, lusts of the flesh, are mentioned. We should avoid these things, and we can avoid these things. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, giving us the necessary power to, to, to not live according to our, the flesh, but we also have that perfect example of Christ, his mind, how he went through. And we have to contemplate, to focus on his Example, the example he set us. And then we have this, this wonderful expression, but to live to God's will. That is the positive side. God's will, God's intention. Now, of course, the perfect example, again, is the Lord Jesus. Because when he was here on earth, he lived according to God's will. God was always glorified by the Lord Jesus. Now, in order to live to God's will, that means according to the will of God, two things are necessary. First of all, we have to know the will of God. And secondly, we have to be ready to do it. Now, how can we know God's will for our life? That is an important question, isn't it? If we have to live according to God's will, we have to, to know it. How do we know God's will? Read the Bible. The Bible tells us what God's will is. And if in certain circumstances, circumstances the Bible does not tell us exactly go here or go there, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We have the possibility to pray in order to understand what God wants us to do or not. Romans chapter 12, well-known verses again. Verse 2, <clears throat> Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, God's will is always good, it's always acceptable, and it is always perfect. But we have to prove, to discern, in certain, certain circumstances, what God's will is. But generally speaking, of course, the Bible tells us what God wants us to do and how we can live according to God's will. The second question is, are we ready to do God's will? Are we ready to be obedient? Are we ready to honor God? That is the important point here. No longer to live the rest of our time to man's lusts, but to God's will. And I would like to finish by pointing out again to our perfect example. Consider him. Contemplate him. Look how the Lord Jesus lived here on earth. That is the best weapon we have and that will help us against our enemies, but it will also help us to live according to God's will, that God might be glorified in our lives as long as we pass through sufferings to that wonderful glory ahead of us. Thank you very much for your attention.